In this video, we're going to discover how glucose can be maintained at proper levels in the blood, even under fasting conditions. We're going to describe the two primary processes that provide blood glucose in the absence of dietary carbohydrates. Glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen, and gluconeogenesis, the production of new glucose from other precursors. We're going to talk about glycogenolysis and use this to predict some consequences of aberrant glycogen storage. We're then going to talk about the relationship between gluconeogenesis and diabetes, and specifically one hormone, cortisol, and how it might connect stress to diabetes risk. It's extremely important that blood glucose is maintained within a very narrow range. In most people, blood glucose is maintained between 4 and 6 millimolar, and this occurs independent of dietary carbohydrate intake. This means that whether you've eaten a large meal or just performed a lot of exercise, blood glucose levels need to be maintained. The reason for this is that some organs, especially the brain, rely almost exclusively on glucose for their energy source. Therefore, any hypoglycemic event or reduction in blood glucose can be very detrimental. Glucose, therefore absent dietary carbohydrates, can be provided to the blood by two processes. Glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen, or gluconeogenesis, the production of new glucose. First, glycogenolysis. That's the breakdown of glycogen. Remember, glycogen is the primary storage form of glucose. It's a branched alpha-1,4, alpha-1,6 polysaccharide containing only glucose subunits. Glucose can therefore be liberated by clipping off those subunits. This occurs through the activity of an enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase. And this enzyme has distinct isoforms that exist in the brain, liver, and muscle. Normally, our bodies have about 500 grams of glycogen, mostly in the liver, but other amounts in our brain and muscle tissue. That 500 grams of glycogen is enough for about a day's worth of fasting in an average person. Glycogenolysis is stimulated by a few different factors. One of them is energy needs, so for example in the muscle, or glucose needs. This is the primary sensing mechanism in the liver. The hormones that drive this breakdown of glycogen include adrenaline, which is activated by the sympathetic nervous system, and glucagon, a hormone that is released when blood glucose levels start to dip. There can be some rare defects in glycogen metabolism. These are known as glycogen storage diseases, and this is helpful for our ability to understand what the role of glycogen is. These are quite rare diseases. Most of them range from 1 in 10,000 people, and some of them only have a few cases ever diagnosed. They could involve either the inability to store glycogen or to break down glycogen. Let's go through one example called Hare's disease. It's an autosomal recessive disease, which is the loss of function of the liver form of glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase is the enzyme that breaks down glycogen. So if you cannot break down glycogen, glycogen will accumulate specifically in the liver. And therefore, when you need blood glucose, that glycogen cannot be broken down. This means that under some events, there's a risk of hypoglycemia, because the liver cannot effectively supply glucose to the blood. And this can be accompanied by elevation in ketone bodies. These are fatty acid breakdown products that accumulate in the absence of carbohydrates. The other process by which glucose is produced is called gluconeogenesis. In this case, glucose was generated from other sources. The main ones in humans are lactate, which is a product of anaerobic metabolism, glycerol, generated by the breakdown of triglycerides, and amino acids, generated by the breakdown of proteins. These precursors are converted through different pathways into glucose, which can then be released. This largely occurs in the liver, but can also occur in the kidneys. The main regulators of gluconeogenesis are insulin, cortisol, and glucagon. We already discussed glucagon. It's elevated when blood glucose levels dip which makes sense that you might want to promote gluconeogenesis while you also promote glycogenolysis. Insulin, on the other hand, prevents gluconeogenesis, and that's why insulin resistance can be associated with increased blood glucose, because insulin is less able to suppress gluconeogenesis, and therefore glucose is generated in inappropriate times. Cortisol is an effector of something called the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, named so for the three organ systems that mediate stress to cortisol release. As shown on the right, stress is sensed, and then that signal is transmitted to a region in the brain called the hypothalamus. It releases a hormone called CRH, which then signals to the pituitary gland, which in turn releases another hormone called ACTH, which signals to the adrenal gland, which eventually releases cortisol. Cortisol then exerts its metabolic effects, which are primarily intended to alleviate the initial stressor. The main things that cortisol does is it promotes gluconeogenesis while also suppressing insulin-stimulated glucose uptake. 
causing more glucose to be produced while also reducing the disposal of blood glucose that shunts glucose towards the brain and away from peripheral tissues. Stress is highly connected to the risk of diabetes. Let's go through one example. In this study, they looked at job-related stress and how it relates to diabetes risk. They categorized people based on the type of occupation they had and how stressful that occupation was. They then connected that job-related stress to longitudinal incidence of diabetes. As you can see in the graph on the right, people who had higher job-related stress over time had a much higher likelihood of developing diabetes. A further follow-up of the study separated these effects between men and women and people who were obese and not obese. First, what they did is they stratified both men and women into four groups, people with obesity and people without obesity and people with high job-related stress and people without high job-related stress. Let's take this one by one. First, the effects of obesity. You can see from the top two rows in both men and women, having obesity increases your risk of diabetes by somewhere between two and fourfold. That's a very prominent effect on the risk of diabetes. Where things look a little bit different is when you layer on job-related stress. If you look at men, men who had higher job-related stress had about the same rates of diabetes as those who were obese but did not have high job-related stress. Those two diamonds are in almost the same place. However, in women, women who had a high-stress job and were obese had a much higher risk of diabetes than women who were obese but did not have job-related stress or women who were not obese and had job-related stress. We don't exactly know the mechanisms by the sex difference between men and women. Take a minute and think of some possible hypotheses by which men and women's job-related stress may propagate in different incidents of type 2 diabetes. In summary, blood glucose levels have to be maintained within a very narrow range, and this can occur in the absence of dietary carbohydrates by two processes, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Glycogenolysis is the first source for blood glucose, and it is activated by both energy needs and glucose demand. Gluconeogenesis is engaged slower, but is a much longer lasting source of glucose. It requires the breakdown of both triglycerides and proteins to provide the precursors to produce more glucose. We talked about how stress can activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and therefore gluconeogenesis. And stress of very many types, and we talked here about job-related stress, can increase diabetes risk.